Welcome, brave souls. It's the weather. You, you made a good choice coming tonight to hear Richard speak. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Richard Hammond. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Waterloo and a principal with Cornerstone Architects. Uh, and I assume people know Cornerstone. Put your hand up if you don't. They're from London, Ontario. There you go. Um, it was established in 1991, and I think if I'm right, it uh, came out of Norbert Schuler's office, a breakaway of sorts, kind of, yeah. Um, and the work that uh, Richard's office focuses on, there's sort of four market sectors, uh, children being one of them, uh, designed for the elderly at the other end of the spectrum, uh, but also education and uh, design for the community. Uh, the projects that they've been involved in, certainly uh, you'll probably recognize some of them, I suspect, uh, are here in London, but also work around southwestern Ontario uh, as well as the GTA. Uh, Cornerstone has been a leader in sustainability um, and have completed a number of projects. And again, uh, I didn't ask Richard, but I suspect we'll be uh, seeing a few of the projects that they've worked on. Uh, where sustainability, whether it's green globes or lead design, has played a, uh, an important part in the design process uh, and looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, Richard, in 2005, became a lead accredited professional. Hands up those that don't know what I mean when I say lead. Hey, we've got a savvy audience tonight. All right. Um, and uh, it's led to uh, his interest, an ongoing interest, in the design of sustainable buildings uh, and what it means not just for buildings but also for communities. And in 2011, he completed a graduate program in sustainable technology at Arizona State University School of Sustainable Engineering uh, and the built environment. And in 2017, uh, he obtained his master's degree in environmental and resource studies from the University of Waterloo. And I know that that was quite a, uh, a triumph, uh, as well as a uh, shoulder to the, uh, the stone to make that happen. It, it, it took some time, uh, but time well spent, as we will discover. So tonight, Richard's going to be uh, sharing with us his insights and experiences uh, in the design of green buildings and, and where we're headed. Uh, but also looking back over the last 20 years of, of what's been happening uh, here in Canada, as well as some of uh, what we can expect to see in the future. So with that, uh, put your hands together. Richard Hammond. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Um, this worked great when we tested it. That has no bearing on how it's going to work now, of course. It's alive. As Tom said, I'm hoping to share with everyone this evening some observations about green buildings, um, taking us back to where I have picked the idea started, and following tracing that idea through to the present time and what's happening around us now, using some examples of our work to illustrate uh, some of these current ideas. And then I'd like to I conclude by looking ahead to the future and how exciting I feel uh, the opportunities ahead of us are. So, um, since I'm giving the talk, I get to pick when we started. And my pick is the publication of the Whole Earth Catalog in 1968 by Stuart Brand. Um, in that publication, I think he was the first one to describe what he called the overview effect, which is that image of the Earth from space, right? Um, astronomy had always been about taking pictures of planets, including the moon and so forth. So somebody finally, on the way to the moon, had the idea to turn around and take a picture of this beautiful, blue, fragile ball. And uh, that became um, the thesis behind the overview effect. And the great thing about the whole Earth catalog is it didn't stop there. It connected um, habitation to the environment. And it was just like a do-it-yourself kit 
of how to uh, inhabit the planet more gently. And uh, I think launched uh, the green building movement at the time. So uh, lots of things happened. Um, some of them crazy. Uh, this is one of the craziest things. This is uh, Paolo Soleri, uh, an Italian-American architect who in uh, 1970 proposed the uh, idea of a uh, completely off-the-grid community, a completely self-sufficient uh, city of the future, as he called it, and he named it Arco Santi. Uh, you can visit it. There you can see that in the top slide, uh, or the top image on that slide. Um, and uh, it was a very heroic attempt, and, and a sort of a tragic ruin um, now. It's fascinating to visit. It's still uh, eking out an existence. Um, and I think it, it just, um, as noble as it was, it demonstrated how complex a question civilization and environment and inhabitation really is. And frankly, I think it was more about poetry than physics and thermodynamics and so forth. And uh, uh, it's still fantastic to visit and still a very dedicated group of people uh, keep it going and make absolutely beautiful cast bronze bells. They just make amazing bells. In fact, that's how the bills get paid, is by these beautiful bells that they make. So if you uh, find yourself north of Phoenix, Arizona, go and see Arco Santi. Time passed, and the next big shock was the energy crisis. Uh, they turned the tap off for the oil supply, and suddenly um, we started thinking about the unlimited petrochemical resources that our House of Cards Society had been resting on. Uh, and in the midst of that, um, as the oil producing countries were kind of declaring economic dominance over the world, uh, the, um, that, the, uh, the um, Saudi uh, oil minister at the time, Sheikh Yamani, made a very, very insightful statement, a quote I really love. He said, the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone, and the Oil Age will end long before the world runs out of oil. Right? They didn't. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. I, I absolutely love that idea. However, the crisis hit. Energy was the thing. Um, it transformed lots of things in our. Uh, society, including you know, automobile efficiency standards came in that the manufacturers uh, resisted vociferously, and the same thing happened to buildings. Right, uh, energy savings became the thing to deal with in in buildings. So uh, there's beautiful little Port Burwell Elementary School and the lovely big windows, and we did things like that. Right, which yes, did save energy. Okay, we grant it. However, um, you know, it destroyed the environment. You know, for the people living in that building, and not only did it do that, but we realized it created this phenomenon called sick building syndrome. Right, we were wrapping the buildings tight as a drum and trapping all the contaminants inside, and forgetting uh, that uh, buildings are for people and not just about saving energy. So um, here's my next milestone, which is a publication of uh, Ed Masria's Passive Solar Energy book in 1979. Um, it uh, was one of the first references to, uh, that brought science to building technology and, and building design. Uh, and it's, I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, it is fantastic. It, is, it just, it, it translates these complex uh, principles and ideas in terms that even architects can understand. Absolutely beautifully illustrated, and it is still a fantastic resource, something we still rely on, uh, on regularly. Very, very practical, uh, and showing you how achievable some of these, uh, these systems and ideas are. So. Um, sustainable design started to become a real thing. 
And uh, it ran up against um, this question about development. And as human society expanded across the world and the world became more urban, um, the question was raised, is there a way of doing development in a sustainable way? Some people would argue that sustainable development is an oxymoron, right? I've heard somebody say that uh, sustainable development is a term where the uh, um, capitalists get the noun and the environmentalists are stuck with the adjective. So um, that's, that's the question that this, uh, the Brundtland Commission uh, in 1970, uh, 1987 was tasked to answer. You know, is there a way? And they suggest that there is, that there is a way of accommodating uh, human development with environmental responsibility. And uh, so they came up with the definition that is generally accepted for sustainable development, which is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs, right? So we do things now with a view to how those things will affect the future. So, um, sustainability became really cool and fashionable in the 90s, and um, it became marketable. And in the 90s, we saw the rise of so-called greenwashing, um, where everything um, was uh, put forward as green or having some kind of green aspect. So I love that cartoon of the fella painting the smokestacks green. Um, and there's lots of examples all around us now. These are current ones. I love the, the, the Bic Eco shavers that you use a couple of times and throw them away. Everybody's been to a hotel bathroom that asks you to help save the planet without mentioning you're actually saving a whole lot of laundry expenses and so forth. And then the last one, I love the Hummer H3 billboard, thirsty for adventure, not gas. You know, proudly only 20 miles per gallon on the highway. So um, the issue with greenwashing or the opportunity that it took advantage of was that there was no commonly accepted definition of what are we talking about when we uh, talk about green things. And in the absence of that, it means sort of whatever you want it to mean. So I think that's really where LEED comes from. Um, and it sounds like everybody knows what LEED is, but just in case you don't know the acronyms, and there's going to be a few of them this evening, LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it is a consensus-based standard that was originally developed in the States in 1998, a broad cross-sectoral um, uh, effort uh, led by the US Green Building Council to try to create a consensus. What are we talking about when we talking about green buildings? And we adopted uh, the Canadian standard in 2004. It was based on the US standard uh, version two with some adjustments for our climate. And then uh, in 2010, uh, there was a new standard that came out that we've been using um, pretty much since then, uh, 2009. Um, B, D, and C is for building design and construction as opposed to renovations and other uh, applications. And the latest, greatest one is LEED version four. It was actually issued in 2013 to some controversy. Uh, both the strength and weakness of LEED is that it's a constantly elevating bar, right? Those of us who have used it will know that, you know, what we did to achieve LEED gold or whatever years ago only gets us to basic certification, if that, now. And so that's what makes LEED such a great standard, that it's constantly improving. But every time it does that, it's sort of past the comfort level of the industry often. And LEED version 4 in particular took a long time to come into popular uh, use. And it has now um, been formally adopted. And that's what we're now using on our current work. So I put together a little slide to help give you a snapshot of how the LEED standard has evolved. So um, on the left is the first Canadian version. And the, um, the, uh, the segments show you how the standard works. So the orange one is um, about sustainable sites. The um, sort of gray one is water. The yellow one is um, energy and atmosphere emissions, which obviously uh, is a key thing for green buildings. The blue one is materials. And the green one is the key thing that we learned 
from the energy crisis and all those mistakes we made with buildings in the 70s, it's the indoor environment. It's remembering that buildings are for people and the quality of the environment is, is a highly emphasized element of LEED. If you compare the, the graph on the left to the one in the middle, you'll notice a couple of interesting differences. And this reflects feedback from the industry on the application of the original standard. And there's a couple of things. First, you'll notice the orange wedge for site impacts got a lot bigger because buildings have tremendous impacts on their environment from stormwater and um, siltation and all kinds of other effects that um, were given much more emphasis in the more recent standard. And you'll notice the yellow wedge got a lot bigger. Um, emphasizing energy because I think that is something that our clients really look to as part of the reason for doing a green building. And as you increase the performance of a green building, it gets harder and harder to get the successively higher level of certification for energy. And in the original standard, there were silly things that you could do to get a credit instead of, you know, using a much more sophisticated building control system to get another energy credit, you could have one room with the right kind of carpet and get a material resource credit. So those sorts of equivalency issues were addressed in the uh, LEED 2009. The very observant in the audience will notice one subtle difference in the version 4 standard. By and large, it's similar to version or the 2009 but there's a light blue wedge. And what they've done is taken the site credit and put a lot more emphasis on where is the site, right? That blue wedge is about the location of the building, how well connected is it to existing infrastructure, intensification, transit, because it's one thing to have a green building sitting in the middle of a field far from any established development. It's another thing in terms of its impact to have it part of a uh, uh, an infill site. So that's the big difference for uh, LEED version 4, plus a whole lot of new acronyms. So um, the Green Building Council is a tremendously progressive and open organization. It makes all of this information available. And um, through the years, uh, various new uh, rating systems have been developed that address different parts of the building, so it's more customizable to the uh, project that you're doing, as opposed to just big new buildings, which is the original, the, the emphasis of the original standard, including houses and even neighborhoods. So lots of information uh, available uh, through the Green Building Council. Tom alluded to it, and there is another really great alternative rating system that we use as much as LEED. It's called Green Globes. Uh, it was actually originated in Canada, but it's become much more prevalent in the US. Um, the General Services Administration that funds all federal buildings in the states considers Green Globes and LEED to be equivalent. And um, there's a lot we like about Green Globes. Uh, I won't dwell on it too much, but um, if people are interested afterwards, I can uh, explain some of the uh, specifics about it. The point is that it's organized in a very similar way to um, the LEED standard. You'll see those same criteria, site, energy, water, resources, emissions, and indoor environment, right? So it's, it's, it's founded on the same sort of structure. It uses the same reference standards from ASHRAE and CSA and other organizations. We just like it because it's a much more versatile, flexible tool. It fits with the way the design unfolds gradually, increasing the level of detail as you go through the design process. So we really like it. And it has a number of other advantages um, uh, uh, for a lot of clients, especially smaller projects and clients that are intimidated, frankly, by um, the onerous, if rigorous and uh, reliable lead standard. Uh, Green Globes is a lot more accessible. So that's, I think, how we got to where we are. And what I'd like to do now is talk about some of our recent work where we've tried to apply some of these ideas. There's a couple of Green Globes certified projects, a couple of lead projects, and some from various different sectors in which we work to try to um, show you at least how we have uh, uh, applied some of these uh, green building principles. So, first one I'd like to talk about is uh, the Community Wellness and Recreation Center in Kamoka, um, designed by my talented partner Allison Hannay. Um, it's uh, about 100,000 square feet and it includes a YMCA, 
a gym, a fitness center, an indoor running track, a library, a twin pad arena. So a real community hub building, a really, really fantastic project to be involved with. And it was intended to serve Kamoka and that part of the county as a real social center. From a uh, sustainable design point of view, it is quite an amazing building, if we don't say so ourselves. It's 80% more efficient than the comparable um, building built under the Model National Energy Code. Um, a lot is thanks to a huge photovoltaic array on the roof of the arena. If you get far enough away from the building, you can see all the PV panels up there. It also employs for making ice an eco-chiller system that rather than rejecting heat to the environment, uses it to heat the building, including an in-floor heating systems and dressing rooms and so forth. So it displaces a lot of uh, fossil fuel energy that uh, we would otherwise have had to use. And I think one of the coolest things about this building is the use of glass. It is a tremendously bright and open building. Lots of different glazing systems uh, were used for different applications, including in the main uh, rink itself. You can skate in the rink with the lights off on a sunny day. It is absolutely gorgeous. All credit to Allison. Here's another one of Allison's projects. This is uh, Claire Hall and the Mercado at Brescia University College, which we did in partnership with uh, Perkins & Will. It's another Green Globes project. This one is five Green Globes certified, which is equivalent to LEED Platinum, so very, very high performance building. It's 131,000 square feet. It includes a 300-bed student residence and a large dining pavilion and a beautiful marché. You know, if you've been to Movenpick, that's the style of the food service. Really, really fantastic. And it is the social hub for the Brescia campus, both for kids that are living on on campus as well as those coming for classes. From a sustainability point of view, uh, it had very, very high achievement of the energy targets that Green Globe, Green Globe sets out. Um, here's an acronym. It, it was the largest VRF system in Canada at the time. Um, VRF is a very uh, versatile and high efficiency um, uh, high heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. It stands for variable refrigerant flow. It's essentially a, a heat pump system, but instead of using water lines, it uses refrigerant lines, so it's a lot more compact and um, extremely energy efficient. Uh, and compactness is sort of a theme of that design and, and of green buildings in general, that a great way to re reduce a building's impact is not make it too big, right? So Brescia has beautifully designed very small uh, rooms and generous common spaces, so more of the emphasis was placed on the common rooms. And uh, the indoor environment is also extremely good. Um, that slide there is the main lounge space, and that's a radiant um, heating system in the floor. So um, when I've taken people on tours, we always take our shoes off and feel how nice and cozy the, the floor is. So really, it encouraged that space to, to be used. Um, this is one of my projects. This is the village at University Gates. It's a project for our client Schlegel Villages, who are a leading provider of elder care and accommodation in Ontario. Um, this is their uh, project that's actually on the University of Waterloo campus, um, and that built, the part of the building that you see in that slide is the Research Institute for Aging, which they founded there at Waterloo. And um, it's an example of a lot of the long-term care projects we do and the new generation of these buildings in Ontario, which is trying to change the paradigm of nursing homes and uh, emphasizing socialization and interaction with the community. And uh, the, the Schlegels really do a great job of, uh, of doing that, not only through the design of the building, but of the programming that goes, that goes into them. And a fun fact, uh, long-term care is the only type of building I know of where there's a funding incentive for LEED certification. There's a, there isn't a funding, it's not mandatory, but if you achieve LEED certification, there is a funding incentive for long-term care facilities. That's usually a question from clients, you know, when we talk about LEED, well, where, what's the funding for it? Well, it's voluntary and there usually isn't funding, uh, except in long-term care facilities. So its performance is also good. Uh, it's a LEED Gold certified project, so it uh, performs much better than the building code or the energy code standard. It has a large uh, PV array on the roof. 
Uh, extremely low water use. You can imagine these kind of buildings, they go through a lot of water, so that was something that was emphasized here. And um, very, very high quality indoor environment. Uh, that bottom right corner is the slide, um, it's, the, it's Main Street. That's what you see when you walk into the long-term care home. It's, you don't see nurses or the typical accoutrements of these sorts of environments. It's a social space, the community is invited to be part of it, 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 it it's, it's hard to take a picture of that area without people in it. And uh, um, it's tricky to accomplish that in these building types because the funding is quite tight and the ministry standards for ventilation and illumination are, are somewhat at odds with what we're trying to accomplish for energy savings. So uh, they are fascinating projects uh, to be involved with. The last project of ours that I wanted to highlight is uh, one of our more recent ones, um, the Western Engineering 3C plus. So you're going to be able to answer a trivia question about what 3C plus stands for. It's connect, create, and collaborate. The, uh, the dean of engineering christened it with that uh, that name, um, and because it's trying to provide space that was missing at engineering and Western. The engineering complex at Western had lots of fantastic lab space, classrooms in very highly programmed specific use types of areas. This building complements those by having, especially on the first two floors, collaborative space, uh, non-programmed um, and not as rooms not associated with a particular discipline so they can be organized by projects across discipline. That's, that's the uh, principle behind, uh, behind this building. And uh, it's targeting LEED Platinum. We have to say targeting because uh, you don't get your LEED certification until your building's done. I like to say the Greening Building Council doesn't take our word for what we're going to do. Our certification's based on what we pr can prove we've done. So once the project is finished, as the other practitioners in the room will know, um, you package up all the material, you submit it to the Green Building Council, and it usually takes about six months for a large building for the certification to come back. And we're confident that this will exceed the requirements for platinum, but we won't know until quite a while after the building is finished. Uh, so it performs very well relative to the uh, uh, energy code. It also has a large uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, array on the roof. Um, really, really low water use. Um, it uses almost no uh, drinking water um, and uh, for flushing toilets, and um, all of the stormwater that hits the building, um, uh, uh, none of it goes into the municipal storm system. There's a huge rainwater harvesting system, and um, you know that was something that they really emphasized as part of the program too. Uh, the civil engineering program uh, emphasized that uh, aspect of this design. Uh, lighting and daylighting is also very important in this building. Uh, one of the trickiest things about it, it faces Western Road, so that long exposure faces west. And that's a very, very tricky thing to handle from an occupancy point of view, from an energy point of view. So a lot of strategies were employed to address that. The top uh, photo is uh, photochromatic glass that can be adjusted. And the, um, uh, the demonstrations anyway, and uh, this is how it's intended to work, are connected to both time and date, so the glass knows what time of year it is and when the sun rises and sets, and weather. So the glass also knows whether it's going to be a sunny day or not. So nobody has to look after it. It will um, change the exposure to maintain the indoor conditions uh, that are programmed. It can be override. Some engineering kid is going to learn how to hack it, so don't be surprised if the glass is, you know, <laughs> going crazy uh, when you drive by. Um, so a lot of those sorts of things are there to see. And at the same time, um, there was a budget. And while the engineering school wanted to achieve LEED Platinum, the university made it very clear that they had to do that on their own dime. That uh, the, there was funding for the project. And Western builds very, very good quality buildings, uh, whether they're LEED certified or not. So the difference between what would have otherwise been funded and what we are doing had to be made up by the, by the engineering school and they committed to that and, and that's where the fundraising has come from. And you can see the math there in that chart. Uh, the lighting and space heaving savings are the most significant ones, uh, but also cooling is very significant. Um, they're so-called um, chilled beams. So instead of a room like this that has diffusers, right? So if it gets too hot, 
those poor diffusers have to try to push pressurized air down here to where the human beings are. Uh, chilled beams work on very, very, very low velocity um, and, te and, and tempering the air very, very gradually so that uh, you're not aware of drafts and uh, uh, it's extremely energy efficient way to do, although tricky, have to be tricky about, or have to be careful about condensation. And uh, the, the other uh, bottom slides are just some images from the computer model. Uh, there's 3D navigable models on Western engineering sites, so if you want to take a virtual tour through the building, you can help yourself. Okay, so the future. Um, uh, there's two quotes about the future that I love. The first one is attributed to the physicist Niels Bohr. He says, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. I am going to make some predictions um, and uh, stick my neck out about where I think we're going with some of these things, notwithstanding Dr. Bohr's caution. My very favorite quote about the future is from the um, uh, sci-fi author William Gibson. He says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think that's very true. You know, I think there's so much happening. I'm hoping to share some of these things with you here today that are you know, it's just concentrated, amazing stuff happening that we just, not all of us have found out about yet. So what do I think is gonna happen? Well, um, let's start with the rating systems, right? We're still gonna continue to see lead and green globes in active use, and they're gonna continue to improve, um, you know, and set higher and higher standards, but there are much, much higher objectives in front of us. Uh, the Canada Green Building Council has just come up with its zero carbon building standard for net zero carbon, net zero energy. So not just you know beating the model energy code, but having no net energy or even net positive energy. Uh, there are two really, really high standards. The, uh, one is the well building standard and one is the living building challenge. And so that, I don't know if my cursor will come to life here for you. There we go. Um, uh, the, the well building standard are the little dots here. There are seven criteria, and uh, they include the conventional things you might associate with buildings, but also um, nourishment and mental well-being, you know. And um, as you know, we struggle to measure other aspects of the, the lead standards that we work with, it raises interesting questions about how do we really measure some of these things, and yet they're extremely important. Um, the Living Building Challenge that's, it has these petals. They're a little more recognizable. I don't know if you can read the, um, the, the, the labels there, but around the petal it's site, materials, energy, indoor air quality, water, and health and, um, health and in, beauty and inspiration, right? It's starting to take that point I made earlier about reminding us that buildings are for people and putting that as the most important thing, right? That let's think about the wellness aspects of, of the environments we're creating and then let's think about all the uh, environmental and energy things that we can do. So those are very, very lofty standards. They have not been well uh, picked up so far yet. It's a, it's a, there's only a handful of projects around the world that are following those standards, but I think it's going to influence what uh, the rest of the industry is doing. The last two are very important ones that we are using. Um, Passive House is a standard from Europe um, that uh, harkens back to those passive energy principles in Ed Mazzaria's book and reminds us, you know what, let's try to keep it simple. Let's try to design as good a box as we can. Very good windows, very good insulation. You know, let's make the envelope and take advantage of the exposure that a building has inherently before we have to add lots of fancy, complicated technology to it. That's sort of the gist behind, behind Passive House. And while it was, uh, and it still is addressed at residential buildings and wood frame construction, it's starting to be used in larger and larger buildings now. And the last one is another connection to Ed Mazaria. Uh, Architecture 2030 is, uh, is a movement, uh, an, an international movement that he started a few years ago. And there's the, those are the bar graphs there in the bottom right that uh, set very measurable and specific targets for us to reduce to zero the uh, net energy use uh, of our buildings um, by 2030. So all of those, 
things, like lead and green globes, are voluntary, right? And it's been up to motivated clients and organizations uh, and advocacy from the consulting community whether people use them or not. That is changing. We are at the dawn of mandatory benchmarking, okay? Um, that is the um, bill passed in New York State for the city of New York for it to become the first jurisdiction, uh, at least in the states, to require publicly posted building energy grades. So all the big buildings, including Mr. Trump's, um, will have a letter grade posted on the front door from A to F, okay, based on their energy performance. And what does that mean? Like, who cares? It's a it's a, it's a piece of paper on the front door of the building, but I think people are going to notice that. You know, if you're looking at an apartment in, in New York for God knows what you have to pay for it, I think you're going to notice, is this an A building or is this a D building, right? It's very, very simple, uh, vivid uh, uh, notice, and uh, it's all tied into uh, Energy Star's portfolio manager. So Energy Star, just like your washing machine, you can get Energy Star ratings for buildings now. The U.S. has a database of thousands and thousands of buildings, so your building can be evaluated on a scale with the typical buildings in the rest of the country, and uh, that's how these ratings in New York are going to work. That's coming to Ontario. Uh, the provincial government passed legislation last year that as of July 1st this year, every building over 25,000 square meters, 250,000 square feet, so these are pretty big buildings, um, they have to report their energy use annually. And then next year, buildings over 10,000 square meters. The year after, buildings over 5,000 square meters. So that's going to be most uh, large buildings. They have to report their um, annual energy use every year. Now, um, they're not getting a letter grade. I think part of this is building our database about, you know, so how are our buildings performing? What is the standard that we're going to be compared to? And eventually you might see some kind of a, a posting. But again, it's tied into the Energy Star uh, portfolio. So that is not only the future, that is, that's here, it's coming. The next big thing on the agenda, in fact, there's a very important deadline passed at midnight. Uh, the federal government has announced uh, a big uh, carbon pricing, carbon uh, cap and trade system for Canada. And all the provinces have signed on, except for Saskatchewan. They're going it alone. And um, it's a very, very controversial thing. It has huge economic impacts depending on the nature of the provincial economies. And what's proposed is a price of uh, $10 a ton uh, starting uh, this year. And it's going to go up by $10 a ton every year to $50 a ton in 2020. So what does that mean? $10 a ton is going to add a couple of cents per liter of gasoline or diesel fuel and a little less than two cents per liter of propane. So it's not huge, but it does add up. And <coughs> if the province, well, the provinces that have signed on to the program uh, it's, a, I think, a very intelligently designed program on the part of the federal government because it gives leeway to the provinces to adapt the uh, carbon pricing scheme that they want to use to their own situation. And so Ontario is targeting some of the big issues, the energy, electrical energy importers, fuel suppliers, and then <laughs> large, large facilities that emit more than 25,000 tons of CO2 a year. So that, like Western would be captured, the hospitals here would be part of this, um, this initial targeting group. And I know they're starting to think about, holy cow, what are we going to do about this? So these things are on, they're on the very close side of the horizon. These, uh, you know, we're going from a, sort of this voluntary don't we feel good and aren't we proud that we've got a green building and have voluntarily certified under the various standards to now having to benchmark ourselves to now having to pay and trade and keep track of our carbon emissions. So the world is changing. And how can we do it? You know, I, I'm reminded of <coughs> the um, 
the reaction from the auto industry, right, and the energy crisis that, oh my God, um, how are we ever going to meet those fuel efficiency requirements? The consumers will not go for it, you know. Um, it'll never work. Well, guess what? The fuel efficiency of our automobiles is just massively better than it was once upon a time. And I think the same thing is going to eventually happen with our buildings. Um, and it would be great if only we could take advantage of that dream of um, fusion energy. You know, it's been this lofty goal of unlimited free power you know, that has been researched for literally decades, and it, it's always 10 years away, you know, this dream of fusion energy. And it would be particularly great if we could put a fusion reactor at a safe distance away, you know, say about 150 million kilometers. Guess what? We already have one, right? That's the Earth to scale relative to the sun. It is such an unlimited source of energy that we sort of fail to appreciate it. And I think gradually we're starting to. One hour of sunlight is equivalent to one year of human energy consumption. That's not just electricity, that's everything. Transportation, heating, everything. One hour of sunlight. There's a great little uh, map, um, and you can barely see the dots on the map of the Earth, but that's the point. With current photovoltaic technology, like forget all the new developments that are happening, current photovoltaic technology, we could power all human energy requirements in 2030 with 0.3% of the Earth's surface. So if you look at that map, there's a big square of, of panels and you know, the, you know, somewhere in the Arizona desert, uh, in the uh, Sahara, in the Gobi Desert, you know, there's lots of places on Earth where hypothetically you could build like 100 square kilometers of panels and uh, generate all of the Earth's power requirements using our current technology. I, I, I just think that is incredible. Yes, how do we get it from those little dots to, you know, where the rest of us are living? But those kinds of so solutions are being worked on and obviously it's not all in one spot. Uh, or doesn't need to be. Um, that uh, bottom right graph is a famous uh, graph from the National Renewable Energy Lab that tracks all the technologies for so, uh, solar, so, solar photovoltaics. The polycrystalline panels that we all use right now is just one of those little lines. There's dozens and dozens of other kinds of technology that are being actively developed, and that graph is showing how their efficiency is improving over the last few years. So um, to try to convince you even more that the solar revolution is here, uh, there's a really great uh, uh, resource from IRENA, the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency. You can go online and you can create these charts yourself by selecting different parts of the world and different technologies, so that's what I did. The top right chart takes those technologies, you know, the thin film solar and silicon and all the other technologies and tracks them. This is only going back to 2011. <coughs> Maybe not even that. Yeah, 2011. Uh, and you can see how rapidly those prices have fallen. That gray band is the cost of fossil fuel energy, right? So they're already well within the cost of developing and operating fossil fuel energy. And you can see some of them are even poking below the cost of fossil fuel energy. There's a point in the US now, south of which it just, you don't need any incentive to put solar PV on your house. You know, there's no program necessary. It just makes sense. If you've got a south facing roof surface and it's not shaded by anybody, it just it pays for itself, literally. And that rising, or the, 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 the lowering cost of the technology, combined with rapidly increasing manufacturing capacity, there's so much investment in this sector and so many things happening simultaneously is accelerating the deployment. So the bottom right slide is a graph for North America uh, solar. And uh, that's 2005 on the far left and 2016. And you can see it's accelerating. It's an exponentially increasing trend. So uh, you can play around with these graphs yourself if you go to the IRENA site. So not only is the solar revolution going to help us achieve these lofty goals of this, these very, very high standards we're going to see um, in, our, in our work, 
but there's also amazing design tools available. These are a couple that we use. Um, Safera is an energy simulator that takes um, our building model and tells us how much energy it's going to use. It can um, quickly tell us you know, the, the benefits of uh, different configurations. Um, it could also tell us about daylighting and views and uh, run many, many iterations without having to get the energy consultant involved and waiting three weeks for their results. The other tool we use a lot is the, uh, the Athena Impact Estimator. It uh, helps track life cycle impacts. So rather than only concentrating on operating energy impacts, which is what most people think about, uh, we can look at systems and uh, how we make the building in the first place and look at its overall life cycle. How long is the building going to last? What are the energy impacts of replacing the materials that we've used over the life of the building? So these tools are really, really helping us understand more about uh, the choices that we're recommending. There's a really uh, exciting other development in design tools. This is some information from the most recent issue of the American Architects, uh, Institute of Architects Magazine Architect uh, this month. Um, under the title Generative Design, there's a firm uh, called The Living in New York City, founded by David Benjamin, and it's using machine learning to uh, give us even greater insight into the designs we're creating. This is uh, Autodesk's new office in, in Toronto, and <coughs> the parameters that were entered into this software um, around that hexagon include individual preference for view, uh, you know, who the relationship in the office needs to be close to, uh, what kind of workspace do they need, and puts these parameters into uh, an algorithm that generates literally hundreds and hundreds of options, and then filters those options according to the client's preference and emphasis and gives you some insight. So I don't think it's going to replace us, hopefully, too soon, but it just gives us much, much more insight into what the possibilities. If the client is saying, this is important, that's important, um, it helps us evaluate those things much more objectively. You can see the, the resulting office space. And obviously, that kind of technology will also greatly improve our capability to analyze things from a sustainable design and energy use point of view. So the AI is entering our office space. There's also some cool new materials that we have as part of our palette. Uh, one of the most interesting ones, I don't even know exactly how to say it, I think it's CO2 in Crete. And um, it's a project at UCLA that has won uh, an X Prize for carbon capture. The idea is, well, if there's too much carbon dioxide in the universe, in the uh, atmosphere, why can't we just directly capture it, like just pull it out and do something with it? So this technology does that with um, industrial smokestack emissions, which are very, very high concentrations of CO2. It sucks that out and actually makes concrete from that material. Quite an amazing idea. Um, another uh, acronym uh, many of you may be familiar with is BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaics. So the idea behind these uh, materials is that we don't build our building and then you know, go and buy panels that we have to put on top of the roof and prevent from blowing away and so forth. The, uh, photovoltaic properties are part of the materials themselves. So uh, Elon Musk's company, Solar City, you can buy some nice uh, Solar City shingles for your roof that generate power. So you don't have to put a regular roof on. You just buy the shingles. They are the roof. And I see a huge development in uh, flat roof membranes that have photovoltaic properties inherent in them. I predict that the clients we're working for right now who are putting flat roofs on their big buildings what, by the time it comes, by the time it comes that uh, they have to replace those roofs in 20 or 30 years, it'll just be a tick box on the order form for the new membrane. Would you like the photovoltaic membrane? Yes, please. Um, and uh, that has tremendous implications for addressing that uh, capacity issue. Where are we going to get the PV capacity from? And lastly, really interesting technology is um, photovoltaic windows. We have the uh, the, the, you know, the adjustable glass, the photochromatic glass that I showed you we're using at Western, that shades itself, it doesn't generate power. The new uh, technology is going to also be able to generate, uh, generate power. 
Um, there's also new ways of building. Um, prefabrication, you know, is something, frankly, we have seen subtly changing in our work. Um, it doesn't meet the casual observer as being very obvious, but uh, more and more of our buildings are prefabricated, much more than you might think. Everything from pre-cut steel studs, right, rather than the guy coming with the chop saw and cutting his studs on site. You know, the floors are pretty flat, so all the studs are about the same size, so they just order them all pre-cut, and that tremendously eliminates waste on the site. But more and more components are going to be pre-cutted. Um, this is a beautiful project by Pat Cow Architects. It's skating shelters that are just these crazy forms uh, um, in Winnipeg, this is, all prefabricated, you know, highly uh, controlled environment, didn't have to be nailed together outside in the elements in Winnipeg. Um, 3D printing is in its infancy. Um, lots of people are playing with 3D printers at home right now. The Chinese are playing with 3D printers for our buildings. And as you can see in that image, the results so far are somewhat uninspiring. Um, however, stay tuned. That project is a, is a building by Watt G, a firm in New York, that won a competition for a 3D prototype house that they are now uh, starting to test uh, using composite materials. So if you can sketch it, you'll be able to 3D print it. And uh, pretty cool uh, opportunities that that opens up. And the last thing are robots. Robots are starting to enter the construction site. That is the tie bot. Uh, coming to a site near you. One of the most tedious jobs in a construction site is tying the rebar together. You've got to take a little piece of wire and you tie the rebar together. Then you go along and you tie the next one. Um, and so a robot can do that now. It can see where it is. It knows where it is on the, in the building. It knows exactly what it's looking at. It can check to see if the rebar isn't what is supposed to be there. And just one guy can supervise the whole thing. The tie bot. The last couple of slides, I want to try to bring this back to um, uh, together, and the city. And how do all of these things contribute ultimately to making better cities? We are becoming an urban civilization. And what we do with our cities is going to determine a lot about the fate of our future society. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, cities are the greenest things humans do. And I, I, I really think that's true. A couple of examples here. The top um, two images on the right are the project you may have heard about at Waterfront Toronto. This was a competition awarded to Sidewalk Labs. I don't know if you know who Sidewalk Labs is, but Sidewalk Labs is owned by Alphabet. And um, one of Alphabet's um, um, divisions is Google. Right? So Alphabet is the parent company. They own Google. They also own Sidewalk Labs, which is their development company. So they are proposing to take this uh, uh, a former industrial land very, very close to downtown Toronto and transform it into a very, very advanced so-called smart community. Um, and not without controversy, you know, there has been some reaction about uh, Big Brother coming to Canada to show us how we're supposed to build our cities. But still extremely exciting, extremely ambitious, and the city is very, very much a partner at the table with the project. Uh, the bottom two images are one of the most exciting things close to home. This is the Sifton's uh, West Five uh, development. Uh, many of us in this room are, 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 are involved with that, uh, with that project. Extremely ambitious. Um, they have set a very straightforward goal of being net zero energy as a community, so when the whole thing is finished um, and the, you know, the interaction between the commercial and residential and other uses uh, will help them, over the course of the year, generate as much energy as that, that uh, community consumes. It's a very straightforward, easy to measure, and uh, ambitious, ambitious goal. At the same time as doing that, they want to create an amazing pedestrian and human environment. You know, so a really, really exciting project here, close to home. Very, very close to home. Um, these grand uh, uh, initiatives are exciting, but the community scale initiatives also make a big difference too. So here are a few of the fun things we've been involved with over the years. Uh, we're big supporters of Reforest London, and you can be too. Um, that top picture is a group of us <coughs> after one of our tree planting sessions with our puppy dogs and some of the kids and so forth. It's really fun. Um, the, the bottom right corner is our street. 
Our neighborhood uh, is uh, participating in Project Neutral. Your neighborhood can get involved as well. It's about tracking energy use and uh, carbon footprints and you know how we uh, compare to uh, the rest of the city and our neighbors. And it sets up a friendly competition between uh, groups of neighbors, you know, sort of two sides of the street. Fortunately, we're on the green side of the street, so we can turn our noses up at the at the red guys on the on the on the red side of the street because they're not as efficient as us. And it's <laughs> partly about providing information and connecting your behavior to how your energy uh, is. Uh, uh, is affected by that behavior and helping you to compare, you know, okay, well, my house is a lot like the house across the street. What am I doing differently um, than them? And then the last one is one of the most interesting things I think that's going to be happening here. Uh, there's an organization called the London Environmental Network, and um, they are starting to develop a Made in London uh, carbon tracking program that we can all participate in. Um, our office, that's our uh, carbon tracking records from 2007 to 2013, those graphs there. And um, we did that through uh, zero footprint a few years ago, but it was very cumbersome. It was directed at very, very large organizations and was really awkward for us to take advantage of. And that's what the London Environmental Network wants to try to do. Um, you know, all of us can track our carbon and, and a little bit like our neighbors on the other side of the streets, maybe the architects can challenge the engineers to, you know, see who has the most uh, cost, uh, energy efficient uh, office space as a community. So all of these things are about um, making measurable progress and, and having some fun doing it. Uh, i like to finish with some recommended reading. This is my current favorite list of recommendations. And uh, um, uh, each of them brings a different perspective to these issues I've been talking about. Um, and I will post this uh, for those who are interested on our website, and I'll give you the, the link at the end of the session so you don't need to write this stuff down if you're interested. But I do want to put in a plug. This is Stuart Brand's recent book. Remember Stuart Brand? He was the first slide, Whole Earth Catalog, 78 years old, still at it. An amazing guy. He wrote this um, uh, incredibly insightful book for the next um, generation. And it did look back and it was critical about some of the things he was part of doing that turned out not to be such a great idea. And makes advice. He reminds us we are not in the 60s anymore. Uh, and, and we need to use the tools that are available for us now to make the kind of progress that we're going to need to make over the, over the near future. So if I had to re recommend one thing to read, that would be it. So that's pretty well it. Um, as I said, I'll put the presentation up on, uh, on our website, cornerstonearchitecture.ca. It'll be under the Resources tab, so Cornerstone Architecture Resources. And before wrapping up, I do want to say thanks to my wonderful partner, Allison, uh, for being part of this great adventure. Where is Allison? There she is. She's right at the back. And, um, and many of the people from the office are here. Just a wonderful team of people that helped make all this happen. And the client organizations, you know, we've been privileged to work with a lot of great client organizations that have provided the kind of motivation and inspiration uh, that's led to this stuff. So I hope this has been, been helpful. I hope it's been insightful. I hope you have some enthusiasm for what's uh, exciting and what uh, the possibilities are going to be for our, for our industry in the very near future. Thank you very much. Yeah, if, if there's time, just after eight, I'm glad to field some questions. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is isn't tracked or is missing. What are what are owners, homeowners doing with the buildings after the design? We go through all the exercise of trying to get this thing energy efficient, and do people actually understand the technology that's behind it? Are you aware of any sort of white paper? For, uh, yeah, for sure. It, that is a huge issue, right? Um, and I uh, have a constant ongoing battle with our mechanical engineers for installing thermostats that you need a mechanical engineering degree to figure out how to use, right? And yeah, there is a growing industry in, um, you know, sort of human-centered design. And 
yes, okay, that may be the latest, greatest thermostat technology and it can get you down to the finest level of tolerance, but if nobody understands how to use it, is it really going to perform its purpose? And it's led to a lot of controversy. Um, a few years ago, a number of years ago, one of the school boards, uh, uh, not around here, um, uh, did an interesting experiment. It had some funding for some new schools, so it built you know, half a dozen schools as they would normally build them, and built a half a dozen schools as green schools, right, under the then LEED standard. And it was a little oversold. They were told that, well, those green schools are going to pay for themselves, they're going to be amazing. Guess what? They use more energy than the ordinary schools, because the ordinary schools still had to be built under the building code, and Ontario's building codes have been pretty progressive. And it was a misunderstanding of the, the, the you know, the sort of the basis um, of LEED, and that, that um, indoor environment thing, right? Because those green schools, they may have used more energy because they were much, much higher quality ventilation and that does take energy, right? And a lot of other aspects, you know, accounted for the energy uh, difference, but a lot of it was they had fancy controls and they went haywire and it was just unmanageable to try to keep track of it. So it's, it's a good sort of a, a caution to us and uh, people like me that get enthusiastic about the newfangled technology that, hang on a second, you know, it's got to be fairly uh, user-friendly or very user-friendly if it's going to work. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, but I mean, I kind of think of, I get the phone call from my mother who's 85, who can't run the VCR. Yes. Yes. But also the CD player, and there's six. Exactly. Right? Why don't you, you know, look at uh, iPads, right? And um, how that has been, you know, in our elder care facilities, everybody has got an iPad and there's there's apps that are directed for you know elderly people who are, may not be computer savvy to use. So the technology is also adapted to that. I don't know who has a Nest thermostat in their house. You know, um, gorgeous thing. You just hook it up and leave it alone, and it will figure out your behavior and when to change the temperature. You know, so I think the te technology is helping to get uh, more sophisticated as well at the same time. Uh, yeah, there you, there you go. There you go. So I guess a quick follow up. Uh, not follow up, just one more question. <laughs> In the presentation, uh, I guess I wasn't surprised you, there was a focus on uh, solar energy. Right. And I, in my own mind, my thought was as soon as the crops went to wind energy, I thought that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, progress that's being made? Yep, for sure. Um, very much so. And if you go onto that IRENA site, if you follow the link that I gave you, you can play around. You can pick wind instead of you know solar, and you'll see a lot of the same things happening. The thing about wind is, um, in an urban setting, it, it, you know there's too much turbulence and so forth. The, basically, the issue with wind: the higher you can get the propeller and the bigger the blade, the better. In fact, that's been a problem with Ontario's manufacturing facilities. They're too small. Right. I don't know if people are aware of this, but you know we've been building these uh, facilities to make wind turbines. Well, that's now the old generation. We can't fit the big blades in our factory. We can't get them out of the factory to the site. So um, wind is also developing rapidly, but more offshore and in these you know more remote locations rather than in people's backyards. Question right there. Yes, and uh, I mentioned the Athena uh, impact estimator. That's all about life cycle impact. And, you know, all our clients are concerned about, well, you know, what's my annual operating cost and efficiency and all that sort of thing. And, you know, seldom look at, well, what's the bigger picture? You know, are, how much concrete are we using? That has a huge embedded energy penalty. So can we really say our building is net zero energy if it's of concrete, unless we're making net more energy every year than we're consuming, we're never going to make up for the impact of the, of the structure itself. And so uh, wood <laughs> has made a real resurgence, right, because it's renewable, right, and it sequesters carbon, right? You grow the tree, cut it down, put it in your building, and that carbon is going to stay there, right? So it's, it is a, it's a growing issue. It's another one of these new factors that the green buildings are, are addressing. Um, it, you know, it is part of what has been transformational about the technology and 
silicon as a material has high processing costs and impacts, right? And so that's where we're seeing the new technologies, the thin film technologies, right, that use a lot less material, that have a lot less, you know, transportation and other costs, starting to come to the, the forefront. Because to some degree, cost is a corollary for these impacts, right? You know, if you have to mine more materials and ship it, you know, if, once you set subsidies aside, the cost is somewhat a corollary for that you know, that resource impact of, the, of those materials. So I think that's what's leading to the development of a lot of these new technologies is, you know, a lo much lower impact. Just going into the order, sir, is that adapted glass or just uh, low heat transfer glass? Yeah, the, you know, glazing, those are not um, uh, the fancy photogrammatic windows, but you can see at the community center is a big shade um, over the southern exposure there. That is the east facade at Brescia, which is, if you have to pick an exposure for some sunlight, east is good because it's not going to be as intense on the uh, energy performance of the building. And glass has very good performance characteristics now. We can do a lot more with glass than we used to be able to do, and then it also gives us daylight. Um, it's extremely good, and you can get different grades of glazing that both is, has a thermal insulation value, but the big thing with a lot of these buildings, even though we're in a northerly climate, you know, most of the projects we do, the energy use is dominated by the cooling, by air conditioning, right? The last big power outage we had in Ontario was in the summer because of the air conditioning demand, right? So the glass also has great properties for shading, um, even though it's quite visible, uh, a lot of the energy in light is actually ultraviolet that the shading helps to block. So it can do amazing things. It's, it's what's avoided us having to do those terrible things to the schools, you know, that slide with the, the school building all blocked up, you know, we wouldn't have to do that now. We could just put state-of-the-art glass in there, even if it wasn't the fancy photogrammatic stuff, and it would still make a huge difference in energy. Yes, uh-huh, they're called ply scrapers. <laughs> ply scrapers, yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. Is that, do you see that in the future? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, ha it hits all the right buttons in, with respect to renewability, sustainability, durability, um, and the new sorts of wood technology that's uh, being developed largely out west is not just lumber. It's uh, cross-laminated timbers. You know, it's in a, it's a wood fibers often recycled in a matrix, which somehow makes it even stronger than you know an actual timber. So I think you're going to see a lot more of that. The challenge with um, wood structures is height. You know, it's still wood, so you know the loading gets greater and greater and greater, and the walls on the lower floor can almost be solid wood. So you have to come up with other approaches for insulation sometimes. And the other big limitation for wood is fire. These buildings have to be sprinklered when they're finished, but it's tricky to protect them from fire during construction. There's been some fairly catastrophic losses, including in Vancouver, of uh, wood buildings under construction. So the construction insurance is starting to become a, a challenge for wood buildings, for big ones. How much more expensive would they be than concrete? I, I think they're less expensive, yeah. As far as just apples to apples, I think a wood structure, if you can do it within the capabilities of the, of the structural capacity of the lumber, would be less expensive for sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, along, the, along the lines of uh, future materials, um, I'm just I'm curious if uh, Grand Earth is ever on the power. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've seen some, um, you know, examples of, of rammed earth for certain kind of buildings, you know, earth sheltered buildings that are built into the side of a hill, you know, really emphasizing the solar exposure. It just strikes me as a bit inflexible. Frankly, it's reminiscent a little bit of the, the sort of types of buildings at Arcosanti, you know, that are very heavy and um, hard to make them comfortable, hard to avoid dampness and all those other issues that come with uh, living inside conditioned space, you know. So I haven't seen good examples of the rammed earth technology myself. Stephen? Uh, I have actually seen some good rammed earth. Okay. Ontario's wet. Not good with rammed earth, really. Mm -hmm. You've got to protect it from moisture. And that's, that's its biggest thing. If you're in a dry climate, it's phenomenal. But 
how to hold the materials available. Anyway, uh, the question I had for Richard was, when we're talking sustainable um, energy sources, renewable, um, the big problem has always been it's available at certain times. Right. So what do you see? I see two issues with, the, with it. One is if we actually do find the household unit that Elon Musk is selling the battery, uh, works all of a sudden we don't need the grid, which gets rid of the whole infrastructure and industry that's out there, which may not be happy to lose its industry. So there's some disruptors there. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's done in the mass sense, they, if they could store that in energy, that would actually be hugely valuable to the province. So mm -hmm. where do you see us going on that storage aspect? Uh, and and there's, there's, there's sort of two questions, sorry. But, uh, Really fascinating subject. If there, I, if, there, if I could put one more slide in, it would have been about grid storage and batteries. That has been accelerating even more rapidly than um, the solar PV, you know, stuff that we looked at previously. Because everybody has realized that, you know, what do you do when the sun goes down, right? And um, a part of the answer in Ontario is wind, actually. There's a nice uh, a balancing act between sun and wind. Um, sun is obviously during the day. Um, it's actually windier at night, right? So those two systems do cooperate together fairly well, but we still need to come up with a good way of, of storing it and then getting the, the power from where it's stored or generated to where, to where we're using it. And a lot is happening, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, activity in that area. And um, there's a, a couple of companies I've <laughs> been in touch with that um, put um, these low-tech so-called iron flow batteries in shipping containers, right? And so they send you battery storage by the gigawatt, right? Like how many would you like? And so that, you know, an example like uh, West 5 or the project in Toronto, I wouldn't be surprised that you see a certain amount of that kind of large capacity storage to help um, improve the efficiency because shipping that um, PV power back to the grid, like on the days that they make too much and, and they have to put it back in the grid, right? You have to convert the DC power to AC power because that's what the grid wants. And there's, there's significant losses of efficiency when you do that. If you can store it in your backyard as, as DC, um, you lose that, that uh, inefficiency. So I think batteries are one of the biggest answers to this challenge that we have in front of us, actually. All right. Thank you very much for your attention on a snowy night.